Director at the Venza Group. Welcome to the Hospitality Webinar Series. Today we have Attorney Montserrat Miller. She is an attorney with uh, the law firm of Arnold Golden Gregory, who is a partner of the Venza Group. Um, and she will be speaking today on Form I-9 compliance. So Montserrat, if you'd like to get started. Okay, thank you, and uh, welcome everyone to today's presentation. I am going to um, go through these slides uh, somewhat quickly just because of timing and then open it up at the end to questions if you have those. So please make sure to save any questions for the presentation as it goes on. But today we're going to look at best practices, tips for uh, completion of the Form I-9, talk a little bit about any discrimination issues that arise with respect to the Form I-9 and what to expect if you are the subject of an I-9 audit by Immigration and Customs Enforcement as well as just briefly talk about immigration reform here in Washington, D.C., which is where I am based and what's happening up on Capitol Hill and what it could mean for the hospitality industry. And I understand that this presentation is uh, tape recorded and will be provided later. So if I go through a slide quickly, don't worry, you will have access to the presentation later. I give these acronyms in this section just because there's so much, uh, so many acronyms are used when it comes to immigration compliance with all the different agencies that are involved and the different programs involved. So I always find it helpful to have a handy list of acronym busters so that we're all on the same page. Let's start with the Form I-9. As you probably already know, and if you don't, you should check it out. There is a new Form I-9, which is available on U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services website. You will note that it has a uh, date of 3813 and a little N after the date, which means that prior versions are not acceptable. So for all new hires effective May of this year, you should be using the new Form I-9. As you probably know, the Form I-9 is used to verify an individual's identity and employment eligibility in the United States. And it is important, and I do see that this happens, that you have I-9s, a Form I-9 for all current employees. And where I see sometimes that employers do not have that is sometimes they think that owner employers don't need a Form I-9, or maybe some of the higher level individuals don't need a Form I-9. And the reality is that if a company has an employee, you need a Form I-9 for all current employees hired after uh, November 6 of 1986. Another thing that I see with the Form I-9 that uh, goes back to my point about having one for current employees. There is what is called, there are retention requirements for the Form I-9, and you are able as an employer to dispose of Forms I-9 given uh, use of a certain uh, schedule that they have, which is three years after date of hire or one year after termination. Where I see some employers make a mistake is they think that that kicks in immediately upon hire. And it's important to know that the retention requirements maintain, are, are to be maintained throughout the life of an employee at the company. And the disposal rule, if you will, only kicks in once the employee has been terminated. Some best practices uh, for Forms I-9 uh, are, are the following. So, as I said, Form I-9 for all employees hired after November of 1986. If you are the subject of a government investigation, one of the first things that they will ask for is a payroll list or a comparable list which shows all current employees. And then they will ask for your original Forms I-9. And they'll match the two to make sure that you have a Form I-9. For each employee, if you don't, it is a uh, substantive verification violation for a failure to present a Form I-9. Some, in, some view E-Verify as a best practice uh, because it sometimes can take the guesswork out of whether the documents are valid or not, barring some really good identity theft. 
there is a basis to consider E-Verify as a best practice, but you have to be realistic to the industry in which you are in. And um, the fact that E-Verify, despite the uh, news sometimes in the media that it doesn't work, it really does work. And so in certain industries, it will uh, certainly have an effect when you create a Form I-9 and then create a E-Verify case. For any federal, just quickly going through some of these E-Verify federal contractor for any uh, federal contracts issued on or after September of 2009, as well as older contracts that have been modified, be aware that if, in fact, you have one in the industry, uh, which some of you may, there could be a FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulations, E-Verify clause, which mandates E-Verify for new hires and those employees assigned to the contract. Um, so, for instance, if you were to provide services um, at government facilities, military bases, you might you should check those contracts to see if they have that E-Verify, uh, the FAR E-Verify clause. There are state mandates around E-Verify. Arizona was the first for private employers, and that has since expanded to include other states like Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Utah. Some of those states have small business exemptions if you are less than 25 employees or less than uh, 10, like Georgia. Some have variances on whether they mandate E-Verify or an equivalent procedure. And so I would look to Louisiana, Tennessee, and Utah for those different requirements. And this is particularly important if you are a large employer that touches several states. You need to be aware of the state mandates in each of the States. Um, and so do, do be aware, like I said, Georgia, the Carolinas have a small business exemption uh, where you are not subject to E-Verify, but you have to go through the states individually depending upon your location. Also, Colorado has an interesting affirmation of work status form that needs to be completed for all new hires, and so just be aware of that form in Colorado as well. There are subcontractor rules uh, which would apply if a company is working with a public employer and the subcontractor would be subject to the E-Verify requirement and sometimes there are reporting requirements as well that have to flow up to the general contractor who then passes those forward to the, um, the public employer such as, and actually there are quite there are more mandates on public employers at the state level to use E-Verify than there are on private uh, employers, but the list is still somewhat lengthy for private employers. And then the final thing is E-Verify as a private contractual matter between an employer and uh, between two entities can require that uh, E-Verify be used as a condition of the contract. With respect to internal training and compliance program, it is always a best practice to have a written hiring and I-9 policy. I believe it's a best practice to photocopy the documents presented to when completing Section 2 of the Form I-9. I've seen them save employers more than they hurt employers when it comes to an ICE audit because you actually have a document that can prove whether the document looked uh, reasonably to a reasonable person would be a valid document. So I believe photocopying of the documents presented for the I-9 Section 2 is a best practice and recognize that if you use E-Verify there is a requirement to photocopy certain List B documents. Um, have a plan of action in place in case of an event, uh, an audit, a government investigation by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Office of Special Counsel, which is under the Department of Justice, uh, the Department of Labor, or a state agency. So definitely have a plan in place if you are the subject of an investigation so that you don't have agents uh, running around on your on-site um, and asking questions of individuals with no knowledge by uh, senior leadership as to the fact that that is ongoing, and have a plan in place to call Immigration Council 
once you receive a uh, what would be a notice of inspection, which is what you would receive if you get a friendly visit from ICE agents, and that notice of inspection is what triggers a government investigation of a company's forms I-9, and they'll typically just show up either randomly or tip or lead driven and present the, the uh, notice of inspection. So you need to have a plan in place, as with any other government investigation, as to how that's going to go up the chain, who's going to be calling who, and how you're going to involve your um, either in-house immigration counsel or outside. I would also recommend that you, depending on the type of um, facility and especially in hospitality, you don't want agents running around your facility. That's not saying that you're doing anything wrong. It's just a reality that you don't want state or federal agents running around. So I recommend putting up uh, restricted area signs or signs that say personnel or employees only. Staying on um, best practices for I-9s, and again, I apologize that I'm talking quickly, but we don't have a lot of time together. Uh, completion, storage, and retention of the form I-9. I am always surprised when I go on site with a client and see that they have um, the office manager or the head of HR, whoever may be uh, the responsible person, and you should always have a responsible person uh, with a backup who dedicates some of their time to the Forms I-9 and E-Verify and other issues around that, that they have the Forms I-9 uh, out in the open and not behind lock and key. And you really, given the significant amount of personal information on those forms, name, date of birth, documents, those need to be in a secure location uh, with restricted access. The same for other personnel records because of the personal information contained therein. There are state laws, separate and apart from the immigration laws, regarding uh, data breaches and the loss by a company of personally identifiable information. And sometimes the combination of a driver's license with a name and date of birth could trigger a uh, data breach requirement if you were to somehow lose those Forms I-9. So definitely have them behind lock and and it's just it's a best practice because you don't want just anyone looking at those forms. Um, it is okay to store forms I-9 electronically. So you can store the forms either in the original paper version with the supporting documents. You can use a vendor and um, have electronic storage of I-9s with e-signature. USCIS has done so far as to say, and the, and the regs actually, the regulation also say this at HCFR 274A, that you can scan them in electronic format and save them presumably in a PDF. I'm not 100% convinced on that, um, that they wouldn't say, well, where are the, that you wouldn't get an ICE auditor saying, well, where are your originals? These are just photocopies. Where are your originals? So I think if, unless you're going to use a vendor, um, who has followed the 274A requirements of 8 CFR with respect to electronic signature, audit trails, et cetera, I would say as a best practice, either have them in the original or use a vendor. Um, be certain to maintain them for the sufficient amount of time after employee's termination. And then I do believe it's a best practice that once an employee has been terminated, you review your I-9, which you keep separate and apart from other personnel records, and you have one bin for current employees, one for terminated employees, that you review the employees who've been terminated in their Forms I-9, apply the schedule that is in the M274, the Handbook for Employers, that allows you to dispose of them once you hit those deadlines, which is three years after date of hire or one year after termination, whichever is later, I think it's best practice to dispose of them. Um, if Be aware, although you don't see the no match letters issued as often as um, we did in the past, they're still out there. They're uh, done on an individual basis. If you receive a no match letter, you do have to act upon it uh, to try to take and have a policy and procedures in place to address them, to reach out to the employee, indicate there's a no match, and to take uh, whatever corrective steps you can 
do recognize, though, and the letter itself says that a no match letter received from the Social Security Administration is not evidence in and of itself that the individual is not authorized to work in the U.S. It's only evidence that the Social Security number and uh, the person's name don't match. Now, if you receive five different letters for the same person, same number, maybe then there is an issue, but um, certainly you have to have a policy around no match letters. SSNVS, the Social Security Number Verification System, be aware that it is not a uh, immigration tool. It, you should not be using SSNVS as a pre-screening tool, just as you don't use E-Verify as a pre-screening tool um, as to whether to hire an individual. It is, in fact, a wage reporting tool. Um, I, I know, in fact, as of last time I checked, that ICE, under their image program, says it's a best practice. I would only use this as a wage reporting tool, but not as an immigration tool, and not have this as a part of one's immigration policies and procedures, is that you must do SSNVS. That's just what I would consider a best practice. Uh, last point here is that the I-9 I audits, self-audits, like uh, the ones that I conduct for employers before a NICE investigation, is considered a best practice by Immigration and Customs Enforcement to use an outside external source. Uh, so I would highly recommend that you consider that if you haven't, because I will give an employer a case of wine if they can prove to me that all their I-9s are done perfectly or even close to it. Because the reality is, especially in, in industries where you have high turnover and a fluctuation of who's completing the I-9s, is that they're not properly completed and better to know that up front rather than subject to an ICE investigation. Uh, tips for the I Form I-9. This is the new form. I just want to point out a couple of things on this form. The Social Security number is voluntary unless you participate in E-Verify. The email address and telephone number is voluntary in Section 1, but if you do submit it and you use E-Verify, then you must input that information. And the reason that they're do asking for that is because they will notify the employee directly of any tentative non-confirmation. But those are voluntary unless using E-Verify. The attestation section, although it may not seem like it, and that's the section that says, I am aware and I attest under penalty of perjury, Super, super, super important that you make sure that your employees properly complete this, not check every box or leave it blank. It is a substantive verification violation if you don't put that little check and you don't complete this section. And these are just the items that I've already gone over. Section two, the one thing that I'm seeing when I do self-audits or I'm representing clients uh, with an ICE investigation is that the employee last name, first name, and middle initial, that box is kind of hidden in there and people are not completing it. Make sure you complete this section as uh, small as it seems when an ICE auditor is looking at these forms with respect to an investigation, uh, that would be a technical violation that you would then have to 10 days to correct. But it's just something, you know, help yourself out now and make sure that you're completing that uh, by inserting the employee name. One thing that I very, do see is don't fill out list A, list B, and list C. The, the form is clear. The, the regulations are clear. You either use need a list A or a list B and list C. You don't get bonus points by doing list A, list B, and list C. In fact, it's over documentation. When one thing that you cannot do is review, have the employee complete section one, and then instead of doing section two, you just simply photocopy documents. I do see this, um, particularly with industries with high turnover, um, like fast food and some others, that they'll just photocopy the documents presented by the employee, but not fill out section two. That's just wrong. It's a violation. You will be penalized for it. You have to complete the form I-9. All right, just some totally random thoughts. 
Um, be aware that the I-94 card, which is there is a picture here, is being phased out by Customs and Border Protection so that when people enter at a port of entry, they are being told they have to go and to an online portal and print out the I-94. And you may see this when completing the Form I-9 for maybe your H-1B workers, H-2 B workers and some others. Just be aware that this little white form is being phased out and is available online instead. So that's definitely a change. I encourage you to check out my and sign up for my immigration compliance and background screening blog. And that is the site. And I, I do talk about immigration uh, and background screening issues as they relate to compliance, I-9, E-Verify, any discrimination. Uh, some more random thoughts. Realize that for the Form I-9, the standard is reasonableness. What would a reasonable person believe with respect to that document presented for the Form I-9 and whether it matches the person who's given it to you and appears to be valid? So that's the test. Does it relate to the person? And is it one of the documents that authorizes work in the US? Any time, especially in, in your industry where there are mergers and acquisitions, you do need to think about the Form I-9, due diligence, whether you're going to assume the liability by accepting the Form I-9 for the company that you're merging with or acquiring, or you're going to treat everyone as a new hire. All right. I am going to keep talking now for, uh, I'm going to do a hard stop in about three minutes for questions, but just want to cover any discrimination issues. Uh, there is the Office of Special Counsel. They are part of the Department of Justice. They do consider um, citizenship status and discrimination, national origin, document abuse, and retaliation or intimidation. There were, in fact, a couple of recent cases in the hospitality industry, uh, Tuscany Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, and Center Plate which uh, was a company that uh, provides um, hospitality services to sports convention centers and entertainment venues in the US. They, Tuscany Hotel and Casino received a $49,000 civil penalty for um, allegedly requesting uh, different or more documents for the Form I-9 than were required by the Form I-9, and also um, demanding specific documents be presented, like maybe the employee pres says that they're a lawful permanent resident, shows you, a green, um, shows you a driver's license and a social security card, but you turn around and say, you know, you indicated you're a lawful permanent resident. I'd really like to see your green card. That's a big no-no. Um, Centerplate actually received a significant fine to the tune of $250,000 plus back pay, plus ongoing monitoring by Office of Special Counsel, and it was for unfair documentary practices. They don't list what those practices were, but that, for OSC, is a significant penalty. There are some examples of when one would be subject to um, either citizenship or immigration status discrimination or national origin. Those will be here, but essentially you cannot treat people differently because they're a lawful permanent resident, a refugee, or then you would a US citizen, you can't ask for different documents as long as they give you something from the list of acceptable documents. Uh, and you can't ask for additional documents. So again, you do not get bonus points for photocopying both their green card, their driver's license, and the social security that card. That's considered over documentation. So, and that's an example here. And I'm going to open it up to questions. Tracy, do we have any questions? OK, I'm assuming that we don't have any. So I will just continue. And if you do, just let us, let us know. A couple of final notes here. Um, like I said, you don't want to ask your Latino workforce, your Hmong workforce, or any other um, individuals that you do not think uh, appear to be Americans 
or look like they're Americans for, for additional or different documents. A big problem that I see is people will present a permanent resident card and then the employer asks and photocopies um, additional documents. And like I said earlier, you do not need a list A, B, and C documents. Montserrat, I'm sorry. I was still muted and talking earlier, but we do have a okay. couple of questions. Okay. What are those questions? Um, the first one is, what were the states that have small business ex exemptions? So um, off the top of my head, Georgia has one, 10 or less. Um, the Carolinas do 25 or less. And the others, I'd have to go state by state. But those are the three that jump to mind. Okay. And should you file the photocopies of the identification with the I-9 or in the personal file? I would keep all documents related to the Form I-9, including the supporting documents, and if you print out the E-Verify confirmation page, separate together and separate and apart from personnel records. So I would have a Form I-9 folder and then a folder for other personnel documents. Okay, great. And the last question is, is E-Verify mandatory? It is, uh, as a general rule, not mandatory unless you are a federal, you are a federal contractor with the E-Verify FAR clause, unless you are in a state that mandates E-Verify, like the states that I listed earlier, starting with Arizona and the others. As a general rule, it is but as a general rule, it's not mandatory. Great. And I think those are all the questions that we have. Um, Montra, did you want to add anything else? Well, just really quickly, since I see we have four minutes, um, and for some reason my slides are not progressing now, uh, just wanted to, OK. so. Know when you go back to it that um, there, the ICE audit and what to expect, talked a little bit about it. Uh, just understand that ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, does have the authority uh, to issue a notice of inspection and in some instances a, a subpoena to review your forms I-9 and um, that if you are the subject of an investigation, I would not recommend you go at it alone that you hire an immigration lawyer for a number of reasons. There are certain documents that could be issued as a result of an audit. Uh, and there are civil penalties that start from 110 per violation for paperwork violations and then can go as, and then for substantive violations start at 375. And that would be if ICE believes that you knowingly hired an undocumented worker or continue to employ someone knowing that they were undocumented. And they actually apply a complicated fee matrix uh, depending on, uh, which will determine at what level you're fined depending on whether you're a first time, second time, or third time, or repeat violator. And I think with that, I, uh, Tracy, I, there's also E-Verify and immigration reform. And the last point that I would mention on that is that uh, keep an eye on what's happening here in Washington, D.C., especially in the House of Representatives, because with respect to the hospitality industry, the biggest issue is mandatory use of E-Verify for all employers over a period of time, depending on which version of the legislation ultimately passes. Uh, there is a move to go paperless on the form I-9 and to have greater use of identity authentication features beyond photo tool if you use E-Verify now. Um, and then greater use of technology, which would help in situations where you have remote hires. And that E-Verify, if it becomes mandatory, would, unlike some states where there are small business exemptions, with the federal legislation, it would preempt those laws and require E-Verify over a period of time for all workers and those with expiring work authorization documents, which is not currently the case. So that was it. Um, I came in right at 1229. I know we're leaving our company at 1230. So if there are any last questions? I 
I think that was it. And thank you so much, Montserrat. And again, if you missed this webinar, or if you know of someone that would want to listen to this webinar after, it will be posted on our website. So thank you so much for joining us. Did you know the term best anonymous with crossover? It's a